Peter, don't. They say if you watch that video, you die. Ah, that's a lot of baloney. Want to know the last time I legitimately cried? September 3rd, 2020, specifically while watching the Super Mario Bros. 35th Anniversary Direct. Why? Well, that was because of one final announcement. Nintendo revealed what was going to be the best game ever released on the Nintendo Switch, and I'm not kidding when I say this, Super Mario 3D All-Stars. Now, for those of you who haven't clicked off the video already, let me explain. You see, I'm not an emotional person, but seeing Super Mario Galaxy on a Nintendo Direct, knowing it finally made its way to the Nintendo Switch after countless years of me wishing to the stars that it would, made me shed a couple of tears. And oh my god, this game delivered. Since its release shortly after on September 18th, 2020, I dumped hours upon hours on Super Mario Galaxy. Um, I mean, 3D All-Stars, which made me conclude that this was my favorite Switch title ever. Now, I know this is another one of my super controversial opinions I have, I mean, look at my Twitter, and I agree with the genuine criticism of this game such as the limited release time, but three Mario titles that define an entire generation of video games all packed into one game compatible with the Switch was well worth the $60 price tag for me. But most of all, being able to play Super Mario Galaxy on the Nintendo Switch, my favorite game of all time, and a game I literally made an hour and a half video on that you guys all seem to love, far surpassed that all-star sticker price. In fact, it's 2024, and I haven't even touched the other two games. Yikes. But this year is different. This summer I made myself a promise. In honor of the warmer weather and clearer skies, I will finally play Super Mario Sunshine for the first time. It sucked. Did you think this was going to be a playthrough video? God no, I'm not subjecting myself to this game any more than I already did. Now, I didn't go into this game completely blind. I've seen gameplay of it, references to it, and I'm quite familiar with the music on Isle Delfino. But from what I've seen of the game before I started my playthrough, it kind of rubbed me the wrong way. And the primary thing that made me feel that way was the voice acting. I'll play a couple of clips so you can see what I mean. The truth is obvious, the guilty party sits among us. It is none other than Mario. Objection! Overruled. I judge the defendant guilty as charged. I hereby order the defendant to clean this entire island. Until Isle Delfino is completely free of his vile handiwork, Mario shall not be allowed to leave. Court adjourned. Leave my mama alone, you bad man. I won't let you take Mama Peach away. Mama? Mama Peach? I'm your mama? Yeah, Papa told me all about it. He told me my mama got kidnapped by a bad man named Mario. So you're Bowser's son? So I came here to rescue her. So the graffiti... When I draw with this, all my wishes come true. A strange old man in a white coat gave it to me. A strange old man in a white coat. Wahaha! <laughs> the water's great, hey, Junior? Sure is, Papa. Come on in, Mama Peach. Uh, I think not. Mario! How dare you disturb my family vacation! Now, nothing against the voice actors, but it just seems so out of place and weird in a Mario game. Especially since every other Mario game keeps real voice lines to a minimum. Bowser Jr. and Flood probably sound the best in my opinion, but even then it couldn't help but burst out into laughter every time a cutscene popped up because it just felt so budget and strange. But it doesn't even matter whether I like the voice acting or not because you can't even freaking hear it. During most if not all of the cutscenes, the background music is so loud that it muffles all of the audio and it just overall sounds very bad. Here, there is no way you do not hear what I'm talking about. 
Welcome to the sun-drenched tropical paradise of Isle Delfino. We're so pleased to welcome you to our beautiful home. Come enjoy a natural wonderland to which we've added the world's finest resort facilities, a spectacular amusement park, and succulent seafood. All this and more await you on Isle Delfino. Come relax and let us refresh your body and spirit. To get rid of all that ugliness. And remember, we'll be watching you, pal. We'll know if you start slacking off. This is a complete rookie mistake I expect from a 2013 tutorial video from an 8 year old, not a AAA game made by Nintendo. I don't know, I just knew before playing the game that that was the paramount thing that differentiated Sunshine from the other mainline Mario games, and always just stuck out to me as an odd choice. The show's creators just made a weird choice. Now that we got the voice acting out of the way, I'm going to segregate my complaints into sections so it's a little more linear and less spontaneous. So first, let's talk about a biggie. The controls, mechanics, physics, and generally how the game operates. Alright, the controls. What I'm referring to is the Dominion, or lack thereof as you will see, the player has over Mario. And guys, they suck. First of all, there are no long jumps. I don't know why, but they just left it out of this game for some reason, while including it in Mario 64, Galaxy, and Odyssey. Next, and I definitely felt this one the most just coming off from Galaxy, there is zero backwards momentum, and the momentum overall is just very counterintuitive. You can't correct your jumps without flood, and you practically have no mobility in the air. The jumping mechanics overall just feel very stiff because of how Mario operates in the air. Because you have no control in the air, whenever you jump, you better know exactly where you're landing because without flood, you can't alter your direction at all. That doesn't sound terrible because like I said, just use flood, but this mainly affects you at unexpected moments where you make a small jump and try to correct yourself only to realize you can't and end up falling off the edge. This also really sucks during the secret courses when you're stripped of flood and you have to rely entirely on Mario's stiff controls in this game. One other small thing relating to jumps is a side flip, they are way too easy to do. Why is that a bad thing? Well, the game has such a large frame window to perform one after Mario turns around that half of the time, you end up doing one without wanting to. So if you want to turn around on a dime and jump, you literally have to wait a good while before you're allowed to make a normal jump. Very niche and specific issue here, but again, one that will affect you more times than you will think. Swimming is also terrible, so what they tried to do in Sunshine with swimming was take the 2D Mario swimming controls and copy it into a 3D game, and that did not translate well at all. In 2D Mario games, you need to routinely press the A button in order to swim up, and release it to swim back down. I bet you're all familiar with that. Now in Sunshine, it's the exact same thing, except you press the Y button to swim down. And might I add, it's so slow. Again, you don't have much control over where Mario goes, unlike in Super Mario Galaxy where you're able to use the control stick to steer Mario to your preferred direction. Another annoying part about swimming is you're not able to jump out of the water unless you release a control stick entirely, which is very dumb since most of the time when you're playing video games, you're not doing inputs robotically, but rather together in a smoother manner. That's what it is. Super Mario Sunshine lacks smoothness. Climbing on cages is awful, and this is something I don't know how the developers thought was clear enough to approve. So when you're climbing on a vertical surface, the A button is how to dismount, and the Y button is how to hit the cage. Simple, right? But when you're climbing on a horizontal surface, the Y button is how to dismount, and the A button is how to hit the cage. Who made this decision? Was it your purpose to confuse everyone? Why are the controls inverted depending on what axis you're climbing on? You don't know how many times this messed me up in game, and again, how did this make it past development? But that's a question we're going to be asking a lot in this video. Last of the big things, the camera. Oh, the camera. 
thankfully an improvement over Mario 64, but not much better. It is a 360 camera, which is nice, but it comes with many problems for a 2002 Mario title. It gets caught, stuck, and glitchy a lot, making it so I don't see where I freaking am. That combined with the controls, and you can imagine it is not a fun time. To end it off, let me list off some smaller, more random gripes I have with the mechanics of this game. Yoshi can't touch water. I don't like how far durian fruits go when you dive into them. You can't wall jump off a wall Mario is too close to or touching. Mario loses all mobility when he touches lava, meaning you can't escape and just die. And finally, not relating to the mechanics, but I hate how they play a sound effect every time a new speech bubble appears. It's super loud and annoying. Watch. <laughs> Okay, next let's zoom out a little to how the game is structured as a whole, and this is where it steers a little more subjective, so you can of course disagree with everything I'm about to say here, but at least understand where I'm coming from, alright? So one thing that was a little weird to me was that every main area in the game had to have 8 missions, also known as episodes. This may seem nice at first, but it made the story feel very repetitive because every area had to follow the same formula of levels. Every location had a secret level, a red coin level, and a shadow Mario level, and most of the time they were in the exact same chronological order. And I don't think those three themes really fit within the context of every world, making the 8 shine quota the developers implemented in this game feel forced and unnecessary. Again, I like the way Super Mario Galaxy handled each level, where it had an apparent connection to the respective galaxy, making the game feel more natural and less like a checklist. In Galaxy, there were many, as I like to call, one-off galaxies in each observatory that only had one mission. And I like that, because if that galaxy had any more stars, the galaxy's gimmick would be overused, so having one mission just felt natural. Of course, the larger galaxies had more stars, but that was because there were more ideas and areas to explore. That's what Galaxy did right. Nothing felt forced. And as for Sunshine, there was a lot of levels that just felt unnecessary. Okay, next let's talk about the story for a little bit. Not the plot, because the plot was fine. I'm talking about the actual progression of the game. It's just confusing. Let me read you a comment I found on YouTube while I was looking up some content surrounding this game. I'm in awe at how unpolished this game is. Skipping some shines will give you a much better experience, but Sunshine's story progresses in such a strange way that you're sort of tricked into thinking you need every shine. In Peach's Castle, there is a clear sense of progression with the different floors. Same for the Comet Observatory lighting up over time. Delfino Plaza just says, eh, sure, here's another level, arbitrarily, and then leaves you without anything for 30 shines in a row. I got up to 60 shines before wondering what the f*** was going on and looking things up online. Something with Sunshine that confused me greatly was the sheer gap in the story to where, like they mentioned, I had no clue what stage of the game I was in. Was I close to being done? Did I have to collect every shine? Did I have to go back to this area? None of these questions are clearly answered by the game, which is concerning to the casual player who may not have much experience with titles like these. For a completionist like me, I made sure to get all of the shines in one area before I moved on, and once I hit 60, I didn't even know it was the end of the game because there was no indication of how far I was into the story. Again, confusing and unclear, which is a huge and ever-recurring theme with this game that you will hear me mention again and again in this video. Also, can't mention the main story without mentioning the post-game, and oh boy it was a drag. So after I completed the main story, what I had left was to obtain all 120 shines, which was double the amount I currently had. So basically the post game was just 100%ing the game, which is fine until I tell you what you need to do in order to get those remaining shines. So 24 of the 120 shines you need to get involve a collectible in this game called the Blue Coin, and holy crap, they are so tedious to get. Don't get me wrong, it's a cool addition to have rare collectibles in hard to reach areas, but in order to obtain every single shine, you also need to collect every single blue coin in this game, which takes forever. 
It may seem fun and adventurous at first, but as time goes by, you'll realize that you cannot do it without a walkthrough just because of how little clues this game gives you about their location. And after the first couple of worlds, obtaining every single blue coin feels so much like a chore and really, really not fun, so expect to spend a lot of time on that. Next, another secret shine involves you obtaining 100 coins in each area of the game. Some are easier than others, but for the ones that are not, again, it is a very time-consuming endeavor. So, unless you're a completionist, I really don't recommend 100%ing this game because you really don't unlock any more content or challenges after you beat the main story unless you consider spending an egregious amount of time collecting blue coins as content. Okay, let's get to the meat of this video. The levels. And oh boy, I'm gonna try to keep my cool with this one. So I think the best way to go about this is first handpicking some of my absolute least favorite levels from this game and then spotting some common themes they all share. First on the list is Petey Piranha Strikes Back from Bianco Hills. And first of all, why do people like this guy so much? I don't understand the cult following around him. And why the f is he in Mario Kart? I digress. This is one of the first levels you play, and one of the first levels where I actually stopped having fun. No exaggerations. So this is a second time you fight PD, and you find him resting across on this island. Given no instructions or prior knowledge at all, you have to figure out yourself that these points here are used to be shot at PD Piranha to wake him up. Not terrible, but they are so hard to aim. And that's not the worst part. Upon waking Petey up, he flies around the entire map, and now you have to launch these guys who control horribly at a moving target that's like a mile away. And while you're standing still aiming, you have to beware of the annoying goobles leap towards you and damage you because if you die, you have to start the fight all over again. It's not that this level is too hard, it's just incredibly long. Especially if you're a first time player like I was, just getting used to Flood. Having to knock him down three separate times, and then ground pounding his belly after filling it with water was just the icing on the cake of how much I disliked this fight. It just took a lot of patience and frustration. The next level I want to get to is Red Coins on the Water from Rico Harbor, and trust me, this one is self-explanatory. The main gripe with this level is the controls and the camera, and compared to the rest of the game, this level is on steroids. A little tip if you did not know, choose the green blooper because it is the slowest and easiest to control. But that won't help you much, the bloopers are so hard to control to the point where you'll rack up multiple game overs before completing this level. And do you know what another awful thing is about this level? Why can't you dismount from the bloopers? And that's not even the worst part! If you bump into anything, and I mean anything, it's an instant death. You don't take damage, you don't fall off the blooper, you just die and have to restart the entire level. And that's fine I guess if the camera works properly and the controls were fine tuned, but you know that's too much to ask for in Sunshine. There are so many times where I or other people seem to die after collecting all 8 coins and just trying to get back to the shine and be done with this terrible level. If you want an even further glimpse at how awful this level is, check out this clip from my boy Nitro. I didn't even know this part existed. <laughs> yeah, I'm at a very manageable speed right now. This is, this is good. This is nice. Ugh. Wait, okay. Ugh, oh, it's so small in there. Wait, do I jump over this boat? Ah! Wait, there was a coin on the boat? Wait, okay. What's going- what's gonna happen? What's gonna happen? I didn't crash? Whoa, that's actually insane. How did I not crash there? Am I gonna f crash here? Please don't. No! What the hell? I don't want you. Stop! What the f I couldn't even turn around! Oh my god, dude. Next up is probably my least favorite level that isn't talked about too much. That is Yoshi's Fruit Adventure, also from Rico Harbor, and is the first time you work side by side with Yoshi. This level encapsulates a lot of what I cannot stand about Sunshine, and we'll get into that in a bit. 
But what I want to discuss here is how annoyingly long and painful this level is. So first you have to make your way up onto the pier and learn that you need to bring a durian fruit over to unlock Yoshi. So you climb on top of this machine and ground pound the switch until it spits out the right fruit, which is completely random. Once you kick this stupid durian over to Yoshi, you need to figure out by yourself that you have to spray Yoshi's juice at these jumping fish to create a platform you can ride on. Because, you know, that's super obvious and makes sense. You have to continue to do this to perfection for the rest of the level until you reach the shine, which takes a while because the platforms move so slow and there are so many of them you have to do. But why I say perfection is because if you fall off, you have to start all over again, which also means spawning back Yoshi because he cannot touch water for some reason. So literally, if you mess up, it is a five minute time loss and you have to repeat everything I mentioned you had to do in this level. It's just a terrible level in general and I never recommend playing it more than you have to. Another horrible level nobody seems to talk about is the Watermelon Festival from Galato Beach. Now this level isn't terrible if you've already played it before and know what to do, but for those who are playing it for the first time, it's a pain. The objective is clear, roll the biggest watermelon to the Pianta over here and he'll give you the shine. But where is the largest watermelon? You'll have to find it. Initially, you may think it's one of these two over here, but upon rolling them over, we are told that this isn't big enough and to find another one. It so happens the largest watermelon is all the way at the top of this hill and we have to roll it over ourselves to the Pianta to get the shine. The only problem is the obstacles. There are so many cataquacks in the way and if the watermelon hits any of them, it gets flung up, destroyed, and you have to go all the way back up again and start over. You need great patience to beat this level, and it's very annoying having dozens of cataquacks chase you while you try to roll this massive thing over to the goal, but the worst part is just how tedious it is. It is very frustrating as a new player getting told again and again that all of your hard work rolling the first two watermelons was for nothing, but once you do find the right one, make sure you don't screw up because if you do, you have to make your way all the way back up to the top of the hill in order to try again. Just a very annoying level. I'm already losing my patience here, and speaking of the devil, the next just awful level is the lily pad ride from Delfino Plaza. This, this is a true test on your patience, even if you're a monk or something. Let's not even talk about the level yet, but just how you get to it. First, you have to bring the correct fruit to Yoshi and together go to this island and just wait. Eventually, this boat circles around the island and picks you up where you again wait until it drops you off on this platform where you have to feed Yoshi so he doesn't despawn. Afterwards, you guessed it, you wait for this second boat to pick you up where you wait until it drops you off at this island where you can finally spray the top of this pipe and play the level. And if you fall off at any point, or if Yoshi runs out of juice, you have to start all over again. And that's not even the level. That's how you get to the level. With a grueling task like that, surely the level is going to be easy and stress free. Nope. It's one of, if not the hardest levels in the game where you have to navigate this very sensitive lily pad with Flood across the poisonous river, collecting eight coins, and if you fall off, you die. It may sound straightforward, but the controls on this lily pad are awful, and jumping to get these coins is terrible. Do you know what's funny? That's not even the worst part. If you happen the game over, which is a very common thing judging by how many attempts it takes to beat this level, you have to do the thing with Yoshi, all over again, wasting another f***ing hour of your time. God, I cannot even begin with how much I hate this level, and what's even worse is that's not even the hardest level in the game. The Pachinko Game. Holy f***ing hell, this thing is god-awful. First, if you want more information about the mechanics of this monstrosity, 
I'll link Swankybox's video on it in the description below. But this is the worst level in the game. This machine flings you into the air where you have little to no control over where you're going and you have to collect 8 red coins. Once you do so, Nintendo gives you the middle finger and spawns a shine right in the center so you have to risk death in order to get it. But just how this level plays is infuriating. It is so hard to control Mario through this stupid thing and if you mess up, you have to start all over again. Again, it's easier to show you than explain it. It's just such a clunky mess with inconsistent physics and tons of glitches you have to navigate just to get each coin. The amount of times I got stuck, or flung somewhere I wasn't supposed to, was insane. This level should be simple, but it is absolutely not, thanks to how horribly flawed the physics are here. And this... this was when I went to Google and looked up, was Super Mario Sunshine playtested? Because after finally beating the Pinchinko game, I, I wasn't sure it was, to be honest. I, I don't think it was. But uh, moving on. And I guess the last level I'll cover here is the last level, Father and Son Shine from Corona Mountain. But believe me, there are much more bad levels that I haven't mentioned here in this video. Corona Mountain wasn't awful per se, rather very underwhelming. The level itself has its difficulty, first having the platform using Flood and then traverse through lava with this boat, which was a little tricky at first, but I was able to get it down after a couple of tries. It's just annoying how you die if you bump into anything though. But once you get through that part, you just have to use Flood to jump on these clouds and up to the boss fight. And here's my problem. The boss fight just sucked. I'm not gonna describe everything about it, but the fight was just short. I actually thought there was a second phase after I finished the fight, but nope. That was it. I just beat the game. It just made me feel super underwhelmed, and it was very anticlimactic in general. Even the level portion before it was short, albeit it had its difficulties. I don't know, it should have definitely been longer because I beat the final fight with ease, and because of that, I just didn't feel rewarded once I did. Alright, now that I've covered everything I wanted to talk about concerning specific levels, let's pull out some common themes we see across the game that really don't make Super Mario Sunshine a good experience. The first and most notorious thing I believe this game lacks is directions and clues. Super Mario Sunshine is absolutely notorious for not giving you the slightest clue on what to do, where something is, or what's going on in the levels. Don't get me wrong, I don't like the video games that are too linear or handholdy, but some levels here are just the opposite extreme. I'll give you some level examples first. One level that I think is the textbook example of my argument is the level Mysterious Hotel Delfino from the Serena Beach area. This is the third shine, and what you have to do is basically roam across the entire hotel to find a pineapple to feed to Yoshi so you can use them to swallow booze in order to reach the shine sprite. I remember myself looking all over for this pineapple, searching in every area of the hotel for at least a good half hour until I gave up. I ended up looking up a walkthrough and couldn't even blame myself for not figuring this one out. So, you have to go into this restroom, notice the slight water damage at the corner of the stall, and what's your first instinct when you see it? Apparently, you're not supposed to disregard it as some sort of detail they added to make the hotel look more dated, but jump underneath it which reveals an entirely new area that eventually leads you to the pineapple. How did they expect people to figure this out? I mean, congrats if you were able to, but I guarantee a majority of the audience, especially the younger ones, would have had no clue what to do in this level. The only slight hint I saw was this Pianta mentioning the water damage in the bathroom, but again, many disregard it as the color dialogue they include in each level. God, there are so many other examples like in Yoshi's Fruit Adventure, the Watermelon Festival, and so many more I cannot even mention due to the sake of keeping this video somewhat concise. But another thing relating to the lack of clues or hints in this game has to do with the blue coins and many of the scattered shines. There are so many areas in this game where shines and blue coins are hidden in the most random places on a level. And by hidden, I mean completely hidden. The only way to obtain them is by randomly spraying that particular spot with flood which will reveal a shine or blue coin. 
Cool if there was an outline or indication that something secret is there, but nope, there is not the slightest clue to tell you that this is an area you must spray in order to find these items. Do the developers just expect you to spray every inch of each level with water until you find these? So if you're missing a couple of shine sprites and have no idea why, these are probably the ones. Stuff like this just actually pisses me off, especially for a Nintendo game. This is a Mario game and is supposed to appeal to all players, casual and experienced, young and old, and for the game to give you little to zero instructions on what to do, hints on where things are, and the controls are just so challenging to learn, it's such a slap in the face to the casual player. It's actually insulting. So, all I can say is don't feel bad or feel like you're cheating if you look up a guide, video, or walkthrough on a level because it's actually required for this game. Some other minor subjective complaint I have is with the bosses. The only fight that I actually thought was good was the Gooper Blooper one. That was creative. PD Piranha and King Boo were annoying, and the Bowser fight was just too darn short. I don't know, I really wish they included more bosses within the game because I think they could have definitely afford to sacrifice a couple red coin or Shadow Mario levels. One other annoying theme I found within the absolutely terrible levels in Super Mario Sunshine, and this will be the last thing I mention, is that they are not fun and waste a lot of your time. There are a lot of levels that are just long, but not challenging. They require you to do a lot of work or a lot of steps that are just tedious and boring. Like climbing, like waiting, or pushing a watermelon that just takes forever. And there's no real challenge to it. But the worst part is, if you get knocked off of what you're climbing, are too impatient, or break the watermelon you're pushing, you have to start all over again. And usually that's just another 5 minutes of work. Stuff like this doesn't make me feel pressed or exhilarated by a challenge, rather frustrated that the mundaneness I had to endure for several minutes in the level has to be repeated again and again until I get it right. There's so many levels I feel just require you to do work, and those are always the levels with the littlest of rewards and most penalizing of failures. Okay, I have two smaller sections I want to get through before I call it for today, and the first one will be more nitpicks about design choice, UI, and stuff relating to that. First of all, what the f*** are these things? Secondly, I don't know why they changed so many classic designs for enemies in Sunshine. Like, I understand they were still experimenting with the designs for these guys at the time, but take a look at what the Boos and King Boo look like in this game compared to the games before and after this. Same with the Bullet Bill and Blooper. Not only do they look freakishly weird, but they also look so distorted compared to the designs we're used to, which makes the game feel that much more isolated from the Mario universe. The show's creators just made a weird choice. Something that I noticed right away when I started this game, which is super lazy on the developer side, is that any object that is behind another object and not in view is rendered as a question mark. It's just really stupid and confusing sometimes, especially when you need to work with a camera that likes to stick itself behind buildings. I don't know, it just looks very cheap on their end. Just jumping around, I don't like how your live counter isn't displayed when you obtain a 1-up or after you die. Typically when those two events occur, you're shown how many lives you have left, but Sunshine left that out for some reason. The lives only show up when you spawn into an area, select the menu, or stand idle for a couple of seconds. Nitpicky, but a weird UI choice. The show's creators just made a weird choice. Next, one time-saving element that totally should have been in the game is the ability to back out of the level select screen. In Sunshine, if you accidentally enter a world you want to quit out of, you have to select a level and then quit out of it from there, which is so much more complicated and time-consuming than having a B button on that menu like Galaxy does. One last decision I don't like, and this relates to the theme of this game wastes my time, when you die, you respawn back at Delfino Plaza instead of the beginning of the level or the last checkpoint. I know it's an exception for the secret areas and other special places like that, but for most cases, you have to re-enter the world, which is just annoying to do repeatedly if you're stuck on something. Oh my god, last thing. Well, at least for now until I can think of more. You may be surprised to hear this complaint from me, but don't take it too harshly. The last section is about music. 
Now, I don't think the music in this game is bad by any means. I have a lot of themes I like. Delfino Plaza, Delfino Airstrip, Bianco Hills, Hotel Delfino, and Rico Harbor are ones I instantly gravitated towards. But, I don't know. Nothing absolutely wowed me to a point where it was an instant favorite. Nothing that was playing around over and over in my head. A lot of the music felt... average to me. Fits the theme of the game, but average. Starshine Beach Galaxy from Super Mario Galaxy 2 has a theme that very much replicates the melody and instrumentals of Super Mario Sunshine, and honestly, I think that one theme is better than anything Super Mario Sunshine produced, even though it's supposed to mimic it. Do you know what? F*** it. Starshine is going to be playing in the background for the rest of the video. Moving on, I do not like the Death or Shine Get jingle. Here, I'll play it. They felt way too wacky and weird with random instrumentals thrown in there like a 6th grade band class, but I digress. My main issue with the OST is there isn't enough! I think it's due to the limited amount of main areas within the game, which is also a complaint of mine, but I feel like the OST is very limiting and quite short when you condense it down to the big core themes of the game. I wish there was more music that could be applied to different levels within each world or what have you, but after finishing the game and independently listening to the soundtrack, I found myself finishing it quite quickly. I also know this is an issue with Mario 64, and I do believe both of those games deserve more music, but maybe during the time it was developed, that wasn't possible. <laughs> Before I completely wrap this video up, it wouldn't be fair of me to leave you guys without giving credit to what Super Mario Sunshine does right. During my initial playthrough, my experience wasn't all too positive, as you can tell by the contents of this video, but there were some aspects of the game I picked up that I really enjoyed, and I think they deserve to be shared as much as the other points I've made. First of all, it's a Mario game. A 3D one at that. Regardless of the title, there's always that innate quality and polish exclusive to the Mario universe. The gameplay is how it should for the most part, the performance is fine, and overall it upholds the standards of a AAA game title. So you can definitely tell by the depth of the game that it's at least been through multiple stages of development, revising, and testing before its launch. It doesn't play like a clunky $2 game you find off Steam is what I'm saying. Next, because it's a Mario game, it always has that nice charm to it. The visual developers did a great job bringing the aesthetic of a tropical resort to the player. The imagery, music, ambient sounds, and dialogue all nicely complement each other to create that hot summer feel. As you can tell from my Galaxy video, I love when developers put love and charm in the areas they're decorating. It really makes the area feel like an escape, but not missing any aspect of the real world. A nice touch I've also noticed throughout playing the game is you're able to see the other areas in the distance from the level you selected. It helps in really connecting the world that we have been playing in, making Isle Delfino feel interconnected and unified. You can see Rico Harbor from Bianco Hills, Pina Park and Delfino Plaza from Rico Harbor, and Serena Beach and Galato Beach from Pina Park. It's really cool how they did all this, and again, it adds to the connectedness to the game which is very important. The game is very lively, full, colorful, and well accounted for. None of the areas in the game feel empty or bare, but are instead filled with life and purpose. The Piantas are a fun and memorable species, with a very rich set of dialogue and funny statements that keep you immersed with an Isle Delfino. Next, something that saved me probably hours of time and was absolutely genius of the developers to do regarded the blue coin. So when you're collecting the blue coins, you're able to just exit the level without completing it, and the game will still register you collecting it. This was so huge when I was 100% in the game because I didn't have to beat each level after collecting the needed blue coins just so the game would save that progress. I could just leave mid-mission and hop to the next level once I got all the needed coins. Again, this was such a brilliant move on them, and I'm so glad they actually factored in how long it would have taken if you also had to beat the level in order to save your blue coin progress into decision. A very player-friendly choice. I'll praise the controls a little bit. I like the spin jump, dive, and how you can slide on water in this game for some reason. But I think Flood is a really nice tool for Mario. Much like spinning is to Super Mario Galaxy, Flood is a really nice tool for correcting your jumps, especially when the controls and momentum are not favorable in this game. Being able to hover in the air for a short period of time gives you a chance to think and calculate where you want to go, as well as be able to fix any mistakes you made when you initially jumped. 
Last thing I want to touch on is something pretty funny. I love the voice clips Mario has when he gets burnt or electrocuted. Take a listen. It's so expressive and funny, but also sounds realistic as if Mario is in genuine pain, as one would imagine getting shocked or burnt to that degree. But absolute props to Charles Martinet for those voice clips. But, I think we finally reached the end of the video. As much as I do firmly believe in the positive tropes I just listed a second ago, I still don't believe the game was that fun of an experience for me. Most of the time playing Sunshine, I was frustrated, bored, or just flat out confused, leading to a more of a unpleasurable playthrough. The main things that did it for me were the stiff, clunky controls, as well as the lack of instructions or clues the game gives you in many of the levels. Both of those things combined just stretched the game out for me to where it felt like I was just wasting a lot of my time. I already know many of you strongly disagree with almost everything in this video, the like to dislike ratio probably shows, but if you have a strong argument for this game or against any of the points I made in this video, feel free to bring them up in the comments. Also, if I made any mistakes with any facts relating to Sunshine, please let me know because that may lighten my perspective of the game. But as of right now, I'm pretty stern of my judgement of Super Mario Sunshine. I didn't like it. Probably the weakest 3D Mario title out there, and I feel bad for those who grew up with the GameCube, honestly. But that's just my galaxy bias showing. Honestly, we were too spoiled. But do I want my time back? No. Do I recommend playing it? Yes. I think Sunshine is a game worth playing once. Just take this video as a brace against the bad aspects you may encounter during your playthrough. It's a Mario game after all, so you'll definitely get your enjoyment out of it no matter how you feel about certain areas of the game. But, I hope you enjoyed this video and maybe learned a couple more things about Super Mario Sunshine. One final note, I would like to thank Nintendo for creating Starshine Beach Galaxy, one level that happens to be better than the entirety of Super Mario Sunshine. Don't forget to leave a dislike, Sunshine fans, and as for me, time to go back to Super Mario Galaxy. See ya! Hi guys, I bet you're wondering why I'm in the wood shop right now. Well, I have two friends to introduce you to. First, this copy of Super Mario Sunshine, and second, my good buddy the circular saw. So you can probably guess what's going to happen here. So let's do it. Super Mario Sunshine, time to meet your maker. <laughs> it's dead.